Well, Hillary Clinton was out giving a speech demonstrating why President Hillary Clinton is such a dangerous combination of words. And don't let anybody tell you that raising the minimum wage will kill jobs. They always say that. Well, they always say it because it's true, right? But she's saying it's not true. And, and what is the proof that it's not true? My husband gave working families a raise in the 1990s. I voted to raise the minimum wage, and guess what? Millions of jobs were created or paid better, and more families were more secure. Well, so what? Just because jobs were created and the minimum wage was raised, it doesn't mean that raising the minimum wage was responsible for those jobs being created. That, that doesn't logically flow. It's bad logic to just assume two unrelated events and, and apply a causal relationship. In fact, if anything, because her husband increased the minimum wage, fewer jobs were created than would have been created. So you can't say, well, I passed the minimum wage and overall jobs weren't destroyed. The minimum wage doesn't destroy all jobs. It just destroys some jobs. And it prevents other jobs from being created. Right? So how do you know? How do you know how many jobs didn't get created because of an increase in minimum wage? You can't measure that because the jobs were never there in the first place. But where you can measure it is looking at teenage unemployment, looking at unemployment among minorities. You know, these are groups that are more disproportionately impacted by higher minimum wages. And yes, all the groups that you would be expecting to be heavily uh, influenced by a higher minimum wage are all struggling. Unemployment rates among teenagers are much higher now than they were before the minimum wage got raised. Um, and, and that is the reason, or one of the main reasons, but it's just basic economics. Again, I'm, I'm talking about this constantly, but wages are prices, right? The wage is the price of labor. So from the employee's perspective, he's getting a wage. But from the employer's perspective, it's a cost, right? What is the price that you have to pay your workers? It's the wages that, that they receive, right? And so if prices go up, what did we say about supply and demand? If prices go up, demand goes down. If prices go down, demand goes up. So if you raise the price of unskilled labor, what does the law of economics tell you? There will be less demand for unskilled labor. That is open and shut. It's not debatable. The fact that the minimum wage destroys jobs is not open for debate. It is cut and clear. Right? Clear-cut economics. Now, you can say that, well, it's better to have fewer jobs that pay more money. Right? You can argue that destroying some jobs is worthwhile because the jobs that are not destroyed end up uh, with higher pay. Right? You can try to make that argument, right? but nobody makes that argument when they're trying to talk about the minimum wage. They want to deny all of the negative consequences. I always admit that there will be some people that will get a pay raise as a result of an increase in minimum wage. But there will be plenty of people who get a pay cut. Their pay will be cut to zero. And not only is their pay cut to zero, but they're now kicked off the job ladder. And so they never have the opportunity to get a job that would have paid a lot more than the minimum wage because they can never get their first job because the minimum wage makes that impossible. So it destroys opportunity. It kills dreams. Yes, there are some people that benefit from other people's dreams and opportunity being taken away, but that doesn't justify it. And of course, the whole economy is made less efficient and everybody pays higher prices. So the damage uh, is enormous from the minimum wage. And I guess the only good thing about the minimum wage is that we haven't raised it uh, recently, although now that's changing as a lot of states are doing what Congress is not and raising their own minimum wage. Although I prefer it on a state level, because A, at least that's constitutional. I think when the federal government does it, it's uh, unconstitutional. But if the states want to do it, at least, you know, the state governments legally can do it. And then, you know, all states aren't subject to the same wage. I mean, why should New York have the same minimum wage as, uh, as Kansas or Kentucky 
you know, or, or, you know, or Louisiana. I mean, there are plenty of states where, you know, you don't need to earn as much money. There are poorer states. The cost of living is lower. Why should they have to deal with the same minimum wage as, you know, New Jersey or California? So let the state set their own minimum wage. And at least then, if a state screws up, it only screws up its own state. It doesn't screw up the whole country, right? So if you want to create a lot of unemployment, don't do it nationwide. Just do it uh, state by state, right? Let them be laboratories of experimentation so that some states can learn from the failures of other states. Don't just adopt a policy and make every state suffer it. But Hillary Clinton wants to say, don't listen to those economists who actually know economics. Uh, just, you know, be brain dead and just pretend that we live in some kind of fantasy world where supply and demand doesn't work, where the laws of supply and demand have been suspended. You know, I wish I could live in a world where the laws of gravity have been suspended and I could just fly anywhere I wanted to go. But unfortunately, I don't live in that world, right? If I want to pretend that I live in that world, it could be very dangerous. If I want to jump off a building and pretend that there's no gravity, right, I'm going to end up killed. I have to recognize the laws that exist, the physical laws that bind me. I have to realize that there is gravity and I can't, you know, defy it. Well, the law of supply and demand is a law, just like the law of gravity. And you cannot defy it. You cannot force wages up without forcing employment down, right? And Clinton doesn't want to acknowledge that because the people voting for her, maybe they're too, you know, uh, foolish to comprehend it or they don't want to bother to think about it. But now what else did Hillary Clinton say, right? Because it wasn't just this. Then she came up with something even worse than the minimum wage, if you can believe that. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody tell you that, um, you know, it's corporations and businesses that create jobs. Well, I mean, someone doesn't have to tell me that. I have to be a moron not to know that. I mean, does anybody have a job and not work for a business? Well, I guess, yes, you can work for the government, right? So, and she does, she does claim that government creates jobs. She says, yes, well, we all know government creates jobs. Yes, they do, right? There's plenty of people who work for the government. But who pays their salary? It's the private sector. You can't have a government job without the private sector because government workers don't produce anything, yet they shop, they go to the store and they buy stuff. Well, where'd that stuff come from? It came from people working in the private sector. And where did the government get the money to pay the salaries of government workers. It had to take it from the private sector. So the only reason that the government can create jobs is because the private sector created jobs first. They created a tax base and they produce stuff that government workers can consume and they pay taxes that government workers can receive in their paychecks. But forgetting about that, there's still plenty of people that work in the private sector. So who do they think hired them? I mean, if it's not a corporation or a business, because even if you're a sole proprietorship, because when she says businesses don't create jobs, she means all businesses, not, not just big businesses, small businesses, anybody who starts his own business. And by the way, entrepreneurship, business creation right now in America is the lowest it's been in this country. Most people aren't starting businesses, which is one of the reasons that we're not creating jobs. But when she says that businesses don't create jobs, she's basically saying employers don't create jobs. Because the businesses are the employers. Forget about the corporations, because corporation is just a form that a business takes, right? Business owners can decide to incorporate. They also can work as a partnership or they can work as a sole proprietorship. So forget about corporations, because it's just a form of business. She says businesses do not create jobs. Well, what do they create? I mean, what are all these workers, if not their jobs? How, how does a business function? right? They have employees. What, what created them? Now, I guess she's, she's going to have to say, well, yes, businesses have employees, but they didn't create the jobs. It's somehow the government magically created these jobs and stuck them on these businesses. Or maybe like businesses don't really want to hire people until the government comes in and forces them to do it. Right. And if it wasn't for government, businesses would operate without any employees. And it's only because of government and politicians like her that businesses have employees. See, otherwise, I guess a business owner would just do it all himself. He would just figure, I can do everything myself. I don't need any help. I don't need to delegate anything. I could just do every single thing all by myself. 
But somehow the government comes in and says, no, 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 no. You, you can't ring up the cash register by yourself. You need to hire somebody. You can't mop the floors by yourself. You need to hire somebody, right? You can't deliver the merch. You, know, you can't do every single job all by yourself, right? It's some government law that is mandating that businesses hire people. What is she talking about? Businesses don't create jobs, right? Don't let anyone tell you that it's corporations and businesses that create jobs. Well, then who does? If it's not the business, who creates the job? It's the government. It's the consumer. Who writes the paycheck, right? It's the business owner. Has anybody ever applied for a job outside of government, right, where you didn't apply to a business, right? Do you drop off your resume? I mean, you just, you just find some individual. When, if you wanted a job, would you just go to a, a fireman or a school teacher or a janitor and just say, hey, can you hire me? I want a job. They would say, well, what am I going to hire you to do? I mean, how, how you, it, maybe if you're looking for a job as a housekeeper or a maid and you want it, then I guess you can apply for a job from an individual. But everybody that wants a job applies to a business. Whether they've incorporated or not, you are sending your resume. You are stopping off at a business. Why? Because you know that only a business can hire you. Only a business can create a job. Anybody can work, right? But a job is a specific kind of work, right? A job is where you show up and somebody pays you. So you can work all day long. You don't need a business to create work. Anybody can go out and work. You don't even have to get paid. You can just work, right? But... A job implies that somebody else is paying you. And the only person who can create a job is the employer who is making it possible. The employer is writing the check and it doesn't bounce, right? So in order to have a job, you need to have an employer. And in order to have an employer, you need a business. Even if it's a sole proprietorship, the guy is a business other than, you know, domestic. You can cut a guy's lawn. You can, you know clean somebody's house and not work for a business. There you can work for a family. So if you want to perform domestic work, you don't need a business. But chances are the household that is hiring you, if you're getting a job, right, working as a gardener or working as a housekeeper or a nanny for a family, somebody in that family is employed by a business, Somebody either runs a business or has a job from a business, and they're sharing that salary with you. They're paid enough from their employer, right, that they have enough left over that they can pay somebody to mow the lawn. So even that job, even those domestic jobs, owe their existence to some business because without the business to pay the household, there's no extra money to pay the gardener or the nanny or the babysitter or uh, the maid, right? The housekeeper. So it all flows from business. Yet she's going to sit there because she's running for president and she wants people to think that if you want jobs, vote for me because government creates jobs. Forget this nonsense about businesses creating jobs. No, 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 no. I will create jobs as president. Vote for me and you'll have a job. Yeah, you know, the government can create lots of jobs, but only by destroying the better paying jobs that the private sector creates and replacing them with lower paying, less productive jobs. And again, the entire Soviet Union was employed. They all had jobs and they had nothing to show for it. They worked all day and had nothing at the end of the day because nobody produced and you waited online for hours to get bread. That's what happens when you have a world where government creates jobs. Where the private sector creates jobs, where businesses create jobs, people are actually rewarded for their efforts. They work productively and they enjoy a high standard of living as a result. You know, she also went on to condemn, right, to condemn trickle-down economics. You know, that old theory, trickle-down economics. That has been tried. That has failed. It has failed rather spectacularly which again is is really it's a straw man right because when reagan talked about it i mean it wasn't you know he didn't call it trickle down you know i mean he might have used the words but it was really the left that tried to put the moniker of trickle down on reaganomics by saying hey tax cuts for the rich and it's going to trickle down to everybody else that's not really what reaganomics was about it was about unleashing entrepreneurship it was about helping to grow the economy 
by reducing the burden that government places on business. And if businesses were allowed to keep more of their income, they could invest it, they can grow the economy, they can employ more people. And from that, prosperity would flow. Adam Smith's The Invisible Hand. I mean, it wasn't really about trickle down. It was about getting the government out of the way, right? Uh, but the left kind of contorted the message and to somehow be, well, if we just give money to the rich, it'll trickle down. And as if any money was being given away, we had such confiscatory levels of taxation that wealthy people were spending most of their time trying to avoid taxes and not and not as much time trying to grow their businesses, which would grow the economy and, and create jobs. So Reaganomics was, hey, let's you know reduce the burden on business. Let's reduce the incentive to escape taxes. And let's reintroduce the market-based incentives to generate more wealth, which will, which will mean more prosperity for everybody. And in fact, the Reagan years don't uh, disprove that. In fact, they bear it out. Now, she goes to the Clinton years and say, look, my husband disproved all that. You know, one of the things my husband says when people say, well, you know, what did you bring to Washington? He said, well, I brought arithmetic. <laughs> and part of it was... Part of it was he demonstrated why trickle-down should be consigned to the trash bin of history. More tax cuts for the top and for companies that ship jobs overseas while taxpayers and voters are stuck paying the freight just doesn't add up. The economy didn't do well or appear to do well during the Clinton presidency because he raised taxes. The economy did well despite those tax increases. You know, she's trying to claim that, you know, my husband brought arithmetic to the White House. Um, because why? Because he balanced the budget. Well, he didn't really balance the budget. What balanced the budget was the stock market bubble that temporarily flooded the coffers with capital gains, the Treasury's coffers with capital gains, and temporarily employed people. But it was also the fact that interest rates came down, and so the debt service costs came down. And because the Clinton administration pioneered the restructuring of the feds, of the government's uh, debt, so that more and more of the debt matured in short run, and we relied less and less on long-term bonds, therefore temporarily uh, reducing the cost of servicing the enormous debt. But the success of the Clinton presidency was more a function of the bubble that Alan Greenspan inflated in the stock market. And that bubble burst. You can't claim that, you know, hey, I'm again, you know, you, you can't look at the financial crisis of 2008 and the housing bubble and think, well, that was bad. But what, what happened under Clinton was good because Clinton's presidency laid the foundation for everything that happened during the Bush presidency. The reason that we inflated a stock market or housing bubble during the Bush presidency was to cover up the problems of the stock market bubble under the Clinton presidency. So what the Clinton presidency proved is that cheap money and an activist Fed don't work. Not that so-called trickle-down economics don't work. You know, any success that the economy may have enjoyed under Clinton, it would have been more successful had they not increased taxes, had they cut government spending instead. Right? But no, they raised taxes. But the fact is that the housing bubble uh, supplied the extra revenue. Normally, the tax cuts probably would have been counterproductive, but they had this other force that overwhelmed them. And of course, a lot of the income was taxed at the capital gains rate, which uh, you know was still lower than the regular marginal rate of taxes that the Clintons raised. So people still had a way around the higher taxes uh, by getting capital gains, and those capital gains were easier to come by thanks to the stock market bubble. But that's a fact that president or presidential candidate here uh, Hillary Clinton always ignores when she tries to glorify uh, the Clinton years, promising more of the same. You know, that's the whole idea. Hey, everything was great under my husband, so vote for me and you'll have all the good times back. Well, the difference is we have a lot more debt now than we had when her husband took office. And so the problems are a lot bigger. And so we're not going to be able to feign prosperity uh, to the same degree that we could before. We're going to be dealing with the consequences 
of her husband's presidency, of the Bush presidency, of the Obama presidency, if we're unfortunate enough to have Hillary Clinton as our next president. 